Today's speaker is Professor Daniel Shiro. He is the Herbert J. Ellison Professor of Russian and Eurasian Studies at the University of Washington's Henry M. Jackson School. He has authored books about social change, ethnic and nationalist conflicts, Eastern Europe, and tyranny. He co-authored the book, Why Not Kill Them All, about political mass murder, which was published in 2010. He was the co-author of a book called The Shape of the New, Four Big Ideas and How They Made the Modern World. His most recent book, which was published just this past spring, is titled, You Say You Want a Revolution, Radical Idealism and Its Tragic Consequences. All of these were with Princeton University Press. Um, in this most recent book, Professor Chiro examined why so many of the iconic revolutions of modern times ended in bloody tragedies and what lessons can be drawn from these failures today in a world where political extremism is on the rise and rational reform based on moderation and compromise often seems impossible to achieve. Professor Chiro also founded the journal East European Politics and Societies and has received support from, among others, the Guggenheim, Rockefeller, and Mellon Foundations, as well as from the U.S. State Department. He has consulted for the U.S. government, the Ford Foundation, CARE, and other NGOs in Eastern Europe and West Africa. Dr. Chiro's pre-recorded presentation will be shown in this webinar without captions, and a link will be provided in the chat to a captioned version available on YouTube. Uh, we are recording this session and a video will be posted on the Strom Center's YouTube channel in the next one to two days. Everyone who, re who registered will receive an email with the link. So this is a pre-recorded lecture and it will be about 35 minutes. We'll take a short three minute break and we'll have a Q and A um, right afterwards. I always begin with questions from students, but then I look forward to your thoughtful questions. For time management issues, short and to the point questions directly relevant to the lecture topic are more likely to be posed to our speaker. Please keep that in mind. Apologies in advance if we run out of time to answer your question. All right, let's hear this wonderful lecture. I, I want to talk about uh, a comparison between the German and Japanese horrors that they inflicted on the territories that they occupied during World War II and what this comparison might tell us about other such nightmares that happened a few before, some later, and about the dangers today and what we can learn about those from looking at this past. The most famous book about what the Japanese did during World War II is the book by Iris Chang, called The Rape of Nanjing. The subtitle is um, The Forgotten Holocaust of World War II. Now what the Japanese did in Nanjing was terrible. In December of 1937, after having met fierce resistance by the Chinese Nationalist Army in Shanghai, they conquered Nanjing. Uh, which was not that far from Shanghai and had been the capital of nationalist China for a while. Nanjing surrendered uh, and the Japanese came in and committed mass atrocities. Uh, they murdered, according to Iris Chang, 300,000 people. That's probably somewhat of an exaggeration. It was at least 100,000, uh, according to census reports made before the war and eyewitness reports by Europeans and some Americans who are living in Nanjing, it was probably close to 200,000, might have been somewhat more, somewhat less. That's not really the issue. What they did was by the international standards of that time, a war crime. They murdered, they tortured, they raped on a mass scale, uh, women, children, the atrocities were almost unbelievable, and we have pictures of them. Uh, I'm not going to put any up. You can find them if you want to. Uh, the thing is that this was approved by the high military command of the Japanese military, including by one of their leading generals, who was a prince in the imperial family, and other leading generals, uh, some of whom were prosecuted after the war and hung as war criminals. Uh, 
what the Japanese did in Nanjing was meant to frighten the Chinese into surrendering uh, by showing them what would happen if they continued to resist. Of course, it didn't work. Uh, the Chinese continued to resist and suffered mass casualties until the end of the war in 1945. Now, what the Japanese did in Nanjing was hardly unique. They committed atrocities everywhere that they occupied. In total, they probably killed about 15 million uh, Chinese, uh, some directly, some by famine, by disease caused by the war. Uh, 15 million is probably a conservative estimate. Uh, they murdered and tortured prisoners of war, Chinese and others. Uh, they conducted uh, terrible uh, biological experiments in something called Unit 731. One of them was to freeze prisoners' uh, limbs uh, and parts of their bodies while they were alive and then hack them off in order to judge what methods of freezing work best. And some of the scientists who were involved in that later on after the war uh, used that knowledge to freeze fish for commercial use and made a lot of money. By the way, the Americans found out about this and captured some of the scientists who had been involved in these terrible experiments, uh, a lot of which were designed to produce biological weapons that were then used on the Chinese. And the Americans wanted that knowledge, and so they didn't prosecute these scientists. They used them, and they, they acquired that knowledge. And in fact, the Americans concealed for a long time the existence of Unit 731. Um, aside from that, the, the Chinese used forced labor um, very cruelly. Uh, they forced occupied territories to hand over laborers, uh, many of whom died, probably around 3 million Indonesians from what was then the occupied Dutch East Indies died that way, and uh, others, uh, not in such huge numbers, but also in substantial numbers from other occupied territories, from Malaya, uh, from the Philippines, and, and so on. Uh, the Japanese uh, kidnapped women to use as uh, prostitutes uh, for uh, Japanese soldiers, the so-called comfort women. Uh, now, when Iris Chang said that uh, this was the forgotten Holocaust of World War II, did she mean that this was uh, exactly the same as what the Nazis did? Well, I don't think that's what she really meant because there are some differences. There was one key difference that I'll try to explain. Uh, what she meant was that the level of horror, the level of cruelty, the level of outright viciousness was very similar, and, in, and indeed it was. Uh, I'm well aware of the fact that if one compares the Nazi Holocaust to other such events before or after, uh, one can be accused of a kind of Holocaust denial, a kind of a soft denial, not, not to say it didn't happen, that kind of hard denial uh, is not put forward by any reputable historian. Uh, but a soft denial that says, well, yes, yes, I mean, the Nazis did this, but others did it too. And, and there were a lot of uh, terrible deaths of civilians and uh, outrages during World War II, and both sides uh, killed a lot of civilians. And so uh, that doesn't negate the fact that what the Nazis did was terrible, but uh, yes, that, that's what people do in war. And uh, I, I don't believe that. Uh, I think that what they did and what the Japanese did was uh, went far beyond what uh, what uh, the Allies did. Uh, though there were terrible things that that, that happened, uh, and uh, I'll try to explain that. By the way, I don't accept the excuses uh, by some conservatives, uh, particularly by the conservative German historian Ernst Nolte that the whole Nazi episode was in part, in large part, a reaction against and fear of Stalinist communism. Uh, I think that the genocide perpetrated against the Jews uh, can't be explained that way, uh, unless you believe that communism was itself a Jewish plot. Now, actually Hitler and many conservatives in Europe did believe that, but the, this notion is actually complete nonsense. So to get back to the main point, to similarities, uh, there were four main similarities. Um, one was that both the Germans and the Japanese had a sense of racial superiority. We are superior. The 
Aryan German people, the Japanese people, and and we want to remain a pure race and not mix or soil our bloodline uh, by mixing with others. And th this racial superiority therefore entitles us to rule others and to have our way uh, just because we are superior. Now I have to point out that of course this was not unique to Germany and Japan in the 1930s and during World War II. Uh, this was a very common attitude uh, by European colonialists, for example, or by uh, white Americans to justify slavery and later the racial discrimination, uh, which still exists to this day in the United States. Um, in large part, actually, uh, this had to do with the triumph of liberal enlightenment ideals in the 18th century. And you can see this in someone like Thomas Jefferson or, or the United States in general, and also in, uh, in liberal democracies in Great Britain and in France in their colonies. And that is, if indeed, as Jefferson said, uh, all men are created equal, then how do you justify slavery? Well, you can only justify it if you say, well, Africans are not quite human. They're, they're human, but they're, they're an inferior kind. And so we're entitled to use them like uh, domesticated animals. And the Europeans in their colonies had exactly the same attitude. I mean, how do you justify colonialism, which was based on violence and conquest and repression in Africa or in Asia, uh, if you really believe the enlightenment principles that uh, all men are uh, created equal and that the men and eventually even in the 20th century women uh, have the right to express themselves politically when you deny that to vast numbers of people you've colonized. Well, you say, well, in some sense, they're really not our equals and therefore not only are we entitled to do this, but actually it's better for them because they're, they're really not up to what we can do or what we can do for them. As a side note, it's interesting that uh, this is a relatively modern idea. I mean, the Romans enslaved vast numbers of people and they never had to justify what they did by saying that there were racial inferiors that they enslaved. In fact, quite the opposite. They enslaved people who were weaker and were defeated. So they enslaved Greeks uh, after defeating them, but they had a great deal of respect for Greek culture. They, they, they tried to use it. They, in fact, used educated Greek slaves to tutor their own children. Now that, that would have been unthinkable uh, in a uh, colonial situation, or certainly in the United States with slaves, you could use slaves uh, uh, to help take care of your children, but you didn't educate them to higher standards by using them because you believed that those you were oppressing were in some sense in fear. The Romans never had any such need to do that. They just enslaved those they could and, and uh, had no compunctions about it, but didn't need to come up with uh, peculiar theories to justify what they were doing. So this sense of racial superiority was not unique to the Germans and Japanese, but it was particularly strong in those cases and is one of the things that explain the cruelty that they imposed on others and the, their notion that they had a right to do this because they were a superior race. Uh, secondly, the Germans and Japanese, uh, partly because of their sense of race, but also uh, because of their sense that they had a right to the conquests that they made, uh, had a kind of contempt for potential allies. And that cost them very dearly. Uh, we know that when German troops entered the Ukraine because Ukrainian peasants had been so terribly oppressed uh, and murdered and, and there'd been a, a virtual genocide of millions of peasants in the Ukraine under Stalin in the early 1930s, we know that uh, when German troops entered uh, Ukraine in 1941, they were met by villagers with flowers because the Ukrainian villagers thought at last we're being liberated from this monstrous oppression imposed on us by uh, Stalin and communism. And instead what they found out was that they were uh, enslaved by the Germans and continued to be. And though there were substantial numbers of young Ukrainian men in particular who uh, served as guards in concentration camps who volunteered, 
on the whole, the more oppressive the Germans became, the more they turned the population there against them and solidified resistance to German invasion within Russia and the rest of the Soviet Union because they saw, well, we may hate Stalin, we may feel oppressed, but uh, at least uh, we aren't going to be treated as, as inferior racial slaves. Uh, and so it, it didn't work to German advantage. And even uh, worse case, uh, worse in the sense, not that there were more deaths, there weren't, but, but that a damaged German war effort was their treatment of France. Uh, after the French army was defeated unexpectedly in 1940 and France was occupied, French leaders, uh, conservative leaders, worked desperately to convince Hitler that if he recognized France, France could become a fascist loyal ally and greatly help Germany. In fact, France was still a major industrial power and the Germans did extract quite a bit, but they could have gotten much more and actually uh, could have had uh, an extremely reliable ally uh, and it might have changed the outcome of the war because France was still one of the leading industrial powers in the world. But in, in, in Instead, the, the French authorities who were begging Hitler, who were begging the Germans, treat us as equal and we'll be your allies, uh, what they got was eventually increasing resistance and much less than they could have gotten because they had contempt for the French and Hitler in particular hated, hated the French. Uh, the Japanese, the same thing. They actually had many potential collaborators among the Chinese. Uh, and uh, the most famous is uh, Wang Jingwei, and they did set him up and some others uh, with formal titles and supposedly independent uh, republics, but they weren't really independent and they weren't, they didn't really get any sort of autonomy that they were asking for. And so, uh, whereas they could have used a substantial number of Chinese collaborators, many more than they actually got, to help them and they probably would have been able to defeat Chiang Kai-shek. Uh, but they didn't do that because ultimately they had contempt for the Chinese. The, the Japanese attitude toward the Chinese was China, Chinese culture at one point was great and they learned something from it, but China had degenerated and therefore it was the right of the Japanese to treat the Chinese with contempt and to uh, oppress and use them. A third reason for uh, German and Japanese horrors uh, was this a sense of ideological certitude. Um, in a way, it was almost religious. I mean, we don't think of Nazism as a religion, but there was some mystical quality about it, a sense that uh, we, uh, the Germans, have uh, an almost divine right to rule Europe and perhaps eventually the world. This, this had something to do with a sense of uh, racial superiority, but it, it went further and was in, in a way quite mystical. Of course, in the case of Japan, it was outrightly religious in, this, in the sense that the Japanese emperor was said to be divine and uh, be the descendant uh, after a long series of emperors. Uh, from uh, uh, the sun goddess. Uh, I mean, it's a little hard to believe that in a modern advanced country in the 1930s, uh, people actually believed that their emperor was divine. Uh, but, but that was the case. And, and that sense that this therefore gave them a kind of divine uh, legitimacy to rule others and to rule Asia and uh, to do what they wanted with others because because it it was really historically decreed in a sense <clears throat> now it's interesting that even in the case of the nazis there was a kind of a religious even you could say distorted christian element to this so what was this constant talk about a thousand year right it, it refers back to the christian uh, to christian millennial thinking and the idea was that at some point in the future that all of history pointed toward a kind of a paradise for German Aryans, not for those who are going to be enslaved, uh, and that this would last a thousand years. And, and uh, it really referenced in some way 
the biblical prophecies that you find in the last book of the Bible uh, about the uh, apocalypse and the struggle between good and evil. And in this case, the good were the Nazis who were divinely fated or fated by history. And, and Hitler was very much of a mystic in that respect. And uh, many of his closest followers were too, that they were certain that, that this was historically faded and therefore entitled them to do anything to make it succeed. Uh, by the way, that wasn't unique either. Um, uh, it's interesting as a side note that uh, Marxism-Leninism uh, was in a sense even more Christian, though the Marxists always denied that they were religious. Uh, so uh, in the beginning, there was Eden, a perfect place. Well, in Marxist eschatology, there was a, a kind of a primitive communalism, a, a primitive community that was ideal and people were living happily because there was no private property. And then something happened uh, in, in Genesis. It's uh, knowledge that is given to Adam and Eve and anger is God who then cast them out. And in Marxist historiography, what it is, is <laughs> the discovery of private property, which ruins everything. Because after that, you have uh, upper classes and lower classes, and you have oppression of the large majority uh, lower classes exploited by the small upper class, and you have police, you have army, you have wars, you have constant conflict, until one day, uh, a prophet comes. Not Jesus Christ, but Karl Marx. And uh, he comes to redeem the world. And his main prophet, not St. Peter, but St. Lenin, uh, does this. But that initiates a great struggle, a war of good against evil. Uh, and that is even closer to the writings about where the world is eventually headed. There's a great struggle. It lasts a long time between the communists and their capitalist opponents, and ultimately communism will win, and class will disappear, and exploitation will disappear, and society will return to the Garden of Eden or to a kind of a heaven, and uh, those who have been communists will be saved. The others will be destroyed. And that justified in the eyes of Stalin and his followers of, I should say, Saint Stalin, uh, because he was deified, Saint Mao, who was also deified, uh, the killing of tens of millions of people. Because uh, as in Christian eschatology, those who have sinned uh, get their deserved fate, they die and go to hell. And so it was for the capitalists and those who opposed. Now, a final um, commonality between German and Japanese horrors. And again, I, I, I do want to emphasize this, that these are not entirely unique. Other societies, modern ones, uh, had some of the same beliefs. The fact is that in the German and Japanese case, they were extreme and all four were present together. So what is the fourth one? Um, the fourth one is um, a sense that they have enemies, their struggle is justified, the oppression they impose on others is entirely justified, history and fate are moving in their direction, but they have enemies and those enemies will fight back. And if they, their enemies win, they will be annihilated. And so to add to this sense of superiority, legitimizing their brutality, is a sense of fear. If, unfortunately, we lose, then they will do to us what we are doing to them. But even worse, they will annihilate us. We will be destroyed once and for all and we'll never be able to recover. Therefore, any means are justified in order to fight against them. Now, again, this is not unique. You see in other genocides, 
uh, for example, the Armenian genocide perpetrated by the Ottoman Turks in 1915 during World War I, when perhaps up to a million and a half Armenians were killed, maybe somewhat less, maybe somewhat more. By the way, uh, differences of 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 here and there don't really make that much difference in the sense that we know that these terrible crimes were committed. So was it a million and a half? Was it, a little, was it more? Was it less? We know about those crimes. We have pictures of it. We have pictures of dead bodies of Armenians being driven uh, into the desert to die. Uh, we know that some Armenians on the coast of uh, the Black Sea were taken out in ships and thrown overboard to be drowned. We, we know all that, just as we know about the Nazi Holocaust, we, just as we know <coughs> about what the Japanese did. There's plenty of evidence. The genocide in Rwanda in 1994 uh, was similar. The Hutu elite was desperately afraid that if the Tutsis defeated them, uh, and there, there was a, a Tutsi army, uh, that if they were defeated, they, they were fated to be annihilated. Uh, and in fact, uh, the Tutsis did win. They stopped the genocide, and they have not annihilated the Hutus, though the Hutu elite that had ruled, of course, was dispossessed. So this sense of fear, again, is not unique. But what we find in the case of the Germans and Japanese, that all four of these conditions were very strongly present. And when they are, uh, the more of them there are, the more likely it is that terrible things will happen. Now, we, we know that there have been other episodes where not all four were present, uh, but where for some reason uh, genocidal actions did take place. It's often has been said, and often has been said, that the first genocide in the 20th century was that of, against the Armenians. That isn't actually the case. The first well documented genocide was committed by the Germans in their colony of Southwest Africa in 1904 1905, in what is now Namibia. The Germans, along with the Belgians, were the most brutal of the European colonizers. Now, all, all European colonization was brutal, but uh, the Germans and the Belgians were particularly bad. Uh, the Belgians, by the way, Belgium was at that time for its, for that period, the early 20th century, a, a liberal democratic society. Uh, and yet they committed terrible atrocities just out of greed in, in, in the Congo. And some estimate that up to half the population died <clears throat> as a result. Uh, the Germans were also very brutal and there was a revolt in 1904 led by the Herero people. Uh, and to the surprise of the Germans who considered these Africans to be no better than uh, intelligent monkeys and therefore incapable of really resisting, uh, th they actually won some victories uh, and the Germans were outraged and sent an army, a large army, and at a time when the German army was the biggest and best equipped and most best disciplined army in the world uh, to commit genocide against the Herero. And we have the documents, the commander of the German army, von Trotte, actually decreed uh, that the Herero are to be destroyed, all of them, They're to be driven into the desert to die. Those who don't wind up there were put in concentration camps where most of them died. Uh, some did escape across the desert to British colonies, uh, which treated them better. Uh, and uh, there uh, have even been historians who have, I think, correctly pointed out, and it's only really in the last 30 years or so that this has been well studied. For a long time, it was known, but it wasn't very well studied and not very well known. Uh, but the, I have said that uh, this example actually had something to do with what the Nazis did, that, that it prepared the Germans for the, the German military for committing these atrocities. Uh, there may be some justification for that. Uh, uh, though other colonial powers, uh, the British and the French, never went so far as to commit a Holocaust. Uh, now, you know, this brings up the question, you know, what is the difference really between the Germans and the Japanese? Well, the one difference is that the Germans set out with the Jews, not with everyone else, to completely annihilate them because of their racial theories, which went further than just we're superior. 
the Japanese never intended to kill all of the Chinese or the Indonesians or anyone else. They wanted to use them and used utter brutality to do so and were extremely cruel. Uh, with respect to the Jews, Hitler believed that he had uh, discovered some great biological principle uh, like Koch, uh, the German biologist who won a Nobel Peace Prize uh, and died long before Nazism. And what he felt he had discovered was that the Jews were a disease and had to be treated like a disease and therefore had to be exterminated. So the way we today want to exterminate the polio virus uh, and have, for practical purposes, exterminated smallpox. And it's entirely justified to do that because uh, this is a disease. And if you let just a few polio viruses escape, they'll reinfect the population. So you have to get all of them. And his notion was that uh, nations fail not because they lose battles or have bad politicians uh, and bad leadership, but because they get polluted by uh, races that uh, uh, perpetrate this disease and weaken them. And the Jews were the main carriers of such a disease. Now, that far, I'm not sure anyone else has really gone that far, at least not in practice, though some might think that way. Uh, but the Germans did. And so they took things even farther than the Japanese. That doesn't excuse what the Japanese did, but it does explain why there was such an extreme kind of behavior toward the Jews and the intent to wipe out all of them, the last one, because otherwise some would survive and repollute the pure, noble Aryan race and therefore weaken it. Well, that brings me to a conclusion. So what do, what do we learn from this? We learned that if these four conditions, uh, so a sense of racial superiority, uh, contempt for others, uh, a sense of ideological certitude that we have the right to do what we're doing because uh, our ideology is the right one and will lead to some kind, if it's carried out, to some kind of an ideal human condition uh, even if that means doing terrible things to those who oppose us, and then a strong element of fear. Uh, now, you know, in the case of the genocide against the Herreros, it wasn't really any of those, it was just revenge. And that too can do terrible things. Uh, and uh, certainly in the case of the Germans and Japanese, there was an element of that too, which I haven't really discussed. The Germans feeling that they had been mistreated at the end of World War uh, I. And uh, the Japanese, that uh, if they hadn't succeeded in modernizing, they would have served the same, they would have had the same fate as, as other a Asians had been colonized. And so that perhaps uh, uh, should be added as an element. But so we know that these things can, can result in terrible outcomes. Uh, I'll tell you just one short anecdote. Uh, in the 1980s, I learned to get by in Indonesian, and I traveled quite a bit in Indonesia, and I spent a week once in a highland village in Sumatra, uh, in the home of a school teacher who was in his 60s, and therefore had been uh, a teenager during the Japanese occupation. And he said to me, the Japanese are an amazing people. In three years, they have managed to make themselves as hated as the Dutch colonizers did in 300 years. Uh, I'm not going to go into any detail about Dutch colonialism, which was not particularly kindly uh, and has a long and complicated history, but it did tell me something about how he and the people around him and his family and his village perceived the Japanese occupation. The Japanese came in and said they were going to liberate Asians from European colonialism, and instead they re-enslaved them and managed to make themselves literally hated and remembered as oppressors in a very short time. So um, we know that the outcomes from these events have been lasting, that they uh, for a long time weren't, forgetting, weren't forgotten, though now the memory of some of them seems to be fading and that brings up the situation today. 30 years ago, it seemed that the ideals of the liberal enlightenment uh, human freedom, human rights, democracy were triumphant. Fascism had been defeated. Uh, then uh, 
1989 to 1991, European communism collapsed. All that was left was liberal, even you could say Western uh, and most strongly American ideals of what the perfect society should be were going to be carried out. Unfortunately, 30 years later, we know that that is not what happened. On the contrary, uh, there's been a regression. Uh, 30 years ago, it was still possible to believe that improvements in uh, racial conditions in the United States, uh, in uh, many of the problems that the United States faced, uh, inequality, uh, problems with the healthcare system, and so on, and even what some scientists were already saying was a serious problem, climate change, that all these would be addressed. None of them have really been addressed at all. And in fact, there's been a regression on, on all of them. And what that means is that we're in now a very unstable situation here and elsewhere in the world. And as a result of that, what we're seeing is actually a return toward the nightmarish conditions in the 1930s that led to the horrors of World War II. Uh, China today is conducting a genocide, according to the Genocide Convention signed in 1948 uh, at the United Nations. A convention, by the way, which the United States didn't uh, uh, join until uh, Ronald Reagan's administration, but has now joined. Uh, there's an article this week uh, in The uh, Economist uh, about what's happening to the Uyghurs, and there's a lot about that, and they're being, their culture is being annihilated, deliberately destroyed, they're being put in concentration camps and turned into essentially slave laborers. Uh, but there are other examples of India, which is a democracy or claims to be a democracy, has veered sharply to the right, and there is the start of very systematic persecution of Muslims. They're a minority, only 9-10% of India, but that's a very large minority. There are a couple of hundred million of them, and things are looking bad. There are other places, uh, the Turks dealing with the Kurds, the Rohingya uh, Muslims in uh, Burma, uh, and other cases. And unfortunately, Though it hasn't happened yet in the United States, we see a rise in the kind of ideologies of racial superiority. It's always been present, but it seemed to be diminishing. It's coming back very strongly and therefore racial conflict. Fear of others, fear of outsiders, fear of inside minorities, justification of cruel means of repression, though certainly I wouldn't say that anything <clears throat> like what the Japanese or Germans did has happened. But we see a rise in the sense that maybe this wouldn't be such a bad idea. Now, those are only extremists, but who 30 years ago or even 20 years ago or even 10 years ago would have suspected that there would be a rise in such sentiments in the United States? So what the German Japanese experience teaches us is that you need fairly extreme conditions to get the extremes that extreme horrors that they committed. You need to have at least some of the ideological conceptions that govern their behavior. But that it can happen anywhere. Germany was not a backward society in 1930. Uh, it was, uh, <clears throat> and it had been for decades, the second biggest industrial power in the world after the United States. It had the most, the most uh, respected and largest scientific establishment uh, before the Nazis came to power. Uh, it had produced great music, great philosophy. It was at the height of, Western civilization, and yet it did this. So no one is exempt. Japan also was a modernized uh, society, the foremost, most modernized society in Asia. It had been a model for many, for many Chinese nationalists who got educations uh, before uh, all this happened uh, in Japan and respected Japan, uh, and yet they committed these horrors. So that, what that means is that when things are going in the wrong direction, 
then uh, the potential rises. And unfortunately, I have to close by saying that that's what I see in much of the world today, and we're not exempt. And I hope, I hope that if I have a sense of pessimism, I hope that I'm wrong. Thank you. Thank you for this rich and illuminating lecture. Students in the course deeply appreciated your comparative and global perspective and students from Southeast Asia um, appreciated that you acknowledged the atrocities committed by Japan in, in this context. So your lecture title posed the question, why did Germany and Japan engage in such extreme mass murder during World War II? And you answered that they shared four characteristics. One, their sense of racial superiority and desire for maintaining racial purity. Two, their contempt for other nations, even potential allies. Three, their sense of divine rights or ideological certitude. And four, the claim that you know, they would do the same to us if the positions were reversed, right? So this fear of annihilation. So first question from um, one of our students, he writes, I think we can probably all agree that we are seeing elements of all four of these conditions today. Is there any way to stop the slide or reverse the trends that we are seeing? Uh, I don't have an answer. Um, I'm worried you'd say that. <laughs> I mean, you know, um, the newspapers, um, the media, online uh, in magazines are full of uh, articles by uh, pundits um, saying we should do this, we should do that. Um, you know, we'll see what happens uh, with the election next week. Uh, we'll see where things go. Uh, clearly, my opinion is that re-emphasizing the liberal values of the Enlightenment is a good idea and emphasizing those ideas, not just some of the hypocrisies and things that went wrong. Um, and I hope that can happen. And, uh, but it's a lot, I mean, I can't tell you exactly what we should do, uh, but it's a long-term project. It's not something that's happened just in the last few years. We've been heading in the wrong direction for a while and uh, whether we recover or not, I don't know. Uh, just very briefly, uh, in the 1930s, the world was going to hell. And uh, the Enlightenment, liberalism, moderation, tolerance was dead in Europe and in East Asia and in the Soviet Union. And Ultimately, the United States saved the world. The United States somehow escaped from that, though there were such tendencies. And uh, if it hadn't been for the United States, uh, the world would have come to be dominated by the Germans and Japanese, or maybe by the Soviet Union, or by some alliance of them, if Hitler hadn't invaded the Soviet Union. Uh, it was touch and go. And the question now is, uh, is there someone who can help right things? And I hope so. Yeah. Okay, so a related question um, from audience member Emily White. She says that, um, you know, the fourth criteria that you mentioned is this, this fear that, right, well, Jews would annihilate us, right, if positions were reversed. She asked if this was a real fear of the Nazis. Is that something we can ascertain or if this is just propaganda? No, so, so it, it wasn't that, that the Jews would annihilate them. Mm -hmm. uh, who would annihilate them would be their enemies. So they were mm -hmm. fighting against the British, the Americans, and um, um, after they invaded the Soviet Union, uh, fear of a Soviet victory. The fear about the Jews was that they were a biological uh, pollution. Mm -hmm. And that's very explicit in Hitler's writing, in Mein Kampf and in his actions and in the quote, scientific team sent out by Himmler, uh, who was in most respects the number two man in Germany, or certainly one of the top four, uh, that he would send out uh, to various conquered areas to measure people's skulls and so on, to make sure that they were Aryans and not Jews and to find Jews. But this notion that 
Jews were a disease and that that was the threat from them. Uh, I, I don't think Hitler ever thought uh, mm -hmm. that Jews alone, certainly not, not Jews alone, but uh, in a sense, I mean, uh, you know, maybe I'm overstating this because Hitler and the Nazis and a lot of European conservatives believe that communism was a Jewish plot and the Soviet Union was a real power. So mm -hmm. in that sense, yes, but this biological notion that, that was ex very extreme. Uh, I should add, by the way, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I slipped up and I mm -hmm. said that Koch uh, won a Nobel Peace Prize. He didn't win a Nobel Peace Prize. He won a Nobel Prize for medicine. And it wasn't his theories mm -hmm. that, that were the basis of Nazi ideology. The really interesting thing is that Koch and others, and Pasteur was maybe the most famous, discovered germs. And they talked about germs and what anti-Semites, not just the Nazis, but anti-Semites in France and elsewhere picked up on this notion. So how come Jews who aren't that numerous, how come they're such a threat? Well, because they're like germs. You can't see, they sneak in and they, um, and, and they pollute and they take over and they're these Jewish plots, but they can hide like a disease. You can't see them. They assimilate, they pretend they're not really Jews. And it was the assimilated Jews that Hitler was most worried about, not those who still were very traditional, but the, but the assimilated ones. Uh, and, um, and that had to be destroyed you know, when, once and for all. So, so mm -hmm. that, that was really his idea. Now, this idea of Jews as a germ mm -hmm. uh, became very widespread among anti-Semites. Uh, uh, just to close on that question, if in 1900 you had asked what country in Europe was most likely to turn against Jews, it would have been France, not Germany. Um, so, uh, but, uh, so this biological theory was Nazi, but it wasn't just Hitler, but Hitler strongly believed in it, and we have evidence of it. Why, why go after the children? Uh, right. so why go after the babies? Why, why go after every last one of them? You know, the Japanese never felt that about the Chinese. They weren't going to kill all of them. They weren't going to kill all the Indonesians. They just wanted to turn them into slaves. That's bad enough. Mm -hmm. But it's this biological element that's so... Yeah. So, I mean, it sounds to me like there are sort of multiple, maybe analogies operating, because we have Jews sort of likened to, to germs. Next week, we're going to hear about Jews likened to animals, right? Um, and... One of the students actually asked about, she connected this kind of Nazi rhetoric about Jews as less than human to rhetoric about African-Americans as less than humans and a lot of like pseudoscientific claims that are made about African-Americans. So, I mean, it sounds to me like, I don't know, racists sort of reach for whatever pseudoscientific knowledge they can. Like it's, this doesn't seem to me like a well-formed ideology, right? Like, well, well they're, different, they're different parts of it. I, I mean, yeah. you, you know about eugenics, and that was quite developed in the United States. And uh, historians have noted that Hitler got a lot of his ideas from um, eugenic studies in the United States. And some of it, uh, not it, it wasn't exterminationist, mm -hmm. but it was pretty bad. And it was very, very widespread. Uh, mm -hmm. And even some famous social scientists at that time, like the French sociologist, Daniel Durkheim, who was Jewish and he wasn't certainly an anti-Semite, but he actually believed that certain races were somehow less developed than others. You know? and, and, uh, uh, so it, it, it is nonsense, but uh, uh, those kinds of theories were, were very wide, widespread. And, and the Nazis just took it further. Uh, not, I mean, people who promoted eugenics in the United States wanted to sterilize some, wanted to avoid certain kinds of uh, reproduction. Uh, some even opposed racial mixing, but uh, not many said, well, we should exterminate all of them. So I think some audience members are kind of struggling to reconcile what they've heard about Japanese attitudes towards Jews, right? For example, right, that Shanghai protected its Jewish refugees with the Japanese attitude towards Chinese. I and mean, can you sort of comment on that or help audience make sense of that? Well, um, uh, I mean, um, 
I, on my father's side, I had an uncle who was imprisoned by the Japanese. He was a, a, a Russian. My, fam my family had come from that side of my family, had left Russia and gone to China. And he was imprisoned in Shanghai, actually. Uh, and he lost all his teeth because of malnutrition. But he, he said <laughs> that sometimes the Japanese uh, would... Uh, and he knew he had business dealings with a lot of Japanese. So, uh, uh, and he said, um, you know, they would say, um, well, well, what is it about the Jews? They're just white people. <laughs> uh, and uh, certainly their attitude toward the Chinese was nothing like that, that they were a disease that had to be exterminated. And the Jews, uh, you know, they didn't, I mean, they, they didn't, it, it wasn't a big issue for the Japanese. And so um, they didn't particularly go after them, um, but um, and the, I, the 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 whole issue of race is very bizarre. Actually, um, the Japanese were made honorary Europeans in many places. Mm -hmm. For example, um, in South Africa, which as a colony already had a form of apartheid and was extremely racist and racial divisions. The Japanese weren't treated as Asians uh, because Japan was a major power. So uh, how do you reconcile that? And, and yeah. the, the more deeply you go into these racial theories, the more bizarre they seem because they're nonsense. I mean, we yeah. know that none of this really works, but so many people still believe these things. Um, Richard Nixon once said that um, he was against abortion. Uh, I'm talking about President Richard Nixon. Mm -hmm. But of course, if it was uh, a cross between an African-American and a white person, mm -hmm. in that case, he thought abortion was justified because that was such a terrible thing. Um. Yeah, it's, you know, it, it's, I was thinking the other day after these hearing these lectures about, you know, that race is a construct over and over, but, you know, we still have to check this category of like what race we are on, on many forms. And I'm starting to feel more and more opposed because yes, right, sure. these formal documentations, they naturalize this category, which, you know, sure. on a scientific level, we know is nonsense. It is not a thing that is real in the world. It is completely something created. Sure. Yeah, 10 years ago, I was in a conference in Armenia and an Armenian academic said to me, he said, why do you call yourselves Caucasian? We're Caucasians, we live in the Caucasus mountains. <laughs> So uh, there's a whole history of, of racial categories. And the more we know, I'm not a biologist, so I, you know, I just read some things, but the more we know yeah. about how much cross, uh, crossings there have been and the complexities, the more we know that these categories, there's white, yellow, red, I, I don't know, there are three, four, five categories, that, that, that's really nonsense. Uh, and uh, so we know that, but, but I don't think most people realize that. Yeah, so I think one of the questions from the audience is about like, how have we not um, enacted better education? Great question. This is a, use your civic responsibility and freedom as an American, if you are an American, to push for better education on this very topic. As my sense is that the United States has feared in, in some ways to directly engage in, in education about deconstructing race in America. So it's something we need to work on. So another question from an audience member, um, did Germans have a deep rooted sense of Aryan superiority or was Nazi propaganda simply highly effective at nurturing it and igniting it? So I think that there was quite a strong sense of cultural superiority, which was not unique. Um, I, I was born in France and uh, um, I've uh, always spoken French and still have French family and the French certainly have it. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and many people have it. I mean, uh, I, I worked uh, and did my original uh, research in Romania, and I heard the same thing in Romania. I heard I heard all these racial theories about how the Romanians were really a pure race and blah, blah, blah. So it, it, it's not just here or, or in Nazi Germany. Uh, and in the early 20th century, people talked about race. So there was a French race, there was a German race, there was an Italian race and so on. Uh, and so that was very widespread. 
what the Nazis did was they took that and carried it to an extreme. And, uh, and there was quite a bit of approval at first. Um, I forgot the title of the book, but there was a book about the American ambassador in early Nazi times, who was a conservative, though he was sent by Roosevelt. And that his, uh, when he first arrived in Germany, so Hitler was already in power and, and he told the Germans, look, I understand, you know, we have these problems with Jews too, and, and uh, they have too much money and this and that. And gradually he realized this, what the German Nazis were doing was way beyond that. And he started sending messages to Washington that were really not quite believed. No, this is much worse. This is not like our anti-Semitism. They don't, don't want to just keep Jews out of their country club. They want to kill them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and it took him several years to figure it out. So, um, I mean, I'm sure that the lecture series, I know that the lecture series yeah. does not want to de-emphasize that unique aspect of uh, German ideology. So if it hadn't been at least widely believed, the, the propaganda wouldn't have worked. Yeah, so an interaction. Yeah, and there were plenty of Germans who were willing to go along with it. And in the occupied countries, there were also plenty uh, who went along with it. Uh, So um, anti-Semitism in Europe was very widespread uh, and the Nazis just took it further, making it biological. And um, and a lot lot of Germans went along with it. Probably not all. but uh, but they went but most went along. Yeah, right. Your your colleague Jan Gross said right, there was really no countervailing group to speak out against anti-Semitism. Right, there was no there were no university faculty or student groups that protested the rise of anti-Semitism. So in Germany, that's right. Yeah, that's that's very hard. By the way, we we will have Susan Glenn speaking about. Um, representations of the Holocaust in America later in the term. So thank you for for gesturing towards that. Okay. So Alice um, from the audience asks about how Jews went from being resented for being more cultured and more educated and more successful to right this perception that Jews can never <laughs> How did, how did that view of Jews is becoming too successful transmute into one of like Jews can never actually assimilate? Like, was the change World War One? Would you say like we? No, well, no, uh, no. You, you, you different groups. So, um, I mean, they're, they're noted scholars of the Holocaust, you know, mm-hmm. um, and who have written about this, uh, the the religious antecedents, uh, which weren't purely racial, because most of the in medieval Europe most of the anti-Semitism Jews could escape if they converted, not always. Mm-hmm. Uh, so how much of it was racial? Well, I mean, that, that's an interesting scholarly question. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, Jews who converted uh, could, could escape in, in a sense. But then these biological theories, so by the early 19th century, it seemed as if anti-Semitism was disappearing in Europe mm-hmm. and the more advanced countries, anti-Semitism seemed to be just kind of a, you know, kind of cultural snobbishness. Uh, but uh, Jews, uh, Jew, laws against Jews, uh, ghettos and so on were abolished. Not, not in the East, not in Russia, but uh, in France, in England, in Germany. Uh, and then it started to come back and, and the biological element was introduced then. It really starts appearing in the middle of the 19th century and gets stronger and stronger. Uh, so, uh, but anti-Semitism of, uh, of all kinds has always been full of contradictions. Jews were evil capitalists and they were also communists. Well, you know, whatever you may think of evil <laughs> capitalists, very few of them were communists. <laughs> and whatever you may think of communists, very few of them were successful capitalists. So h- how do you do both things together? Well, somehow that didn't seem to bother a lot of anti-Semites. And, uh, so, so, so you had to invent this is what's so alarming about some of what's happening in the United States, that people are accepting large numbers of people, very bizarre theories in all sorts of ways. Uh, But people had to accept the notion that Jews were so devilish that they could be both capitalists and communists. Uh, 
something which uh, you know Lenin and Stalin didn't believe in, uh, and, and neither did rich capitalists. Yeah, so it's interesting, right? Nirenberg in his book Anti Judaism: and The Western Tradition also points to the you know the moment in Spain where right the Jews are being forcibly converse, uh, converted to Christianity. Right, so there could have been a world free of Jews, but that's exactly the moment in which you get the racialization of Jewish identity, right? So that, it's, that seems the same thing sort of happened that moment where Jews are almost converted, like you sort of have to make them appear again because you need that other so yeah. much. Well, and there, but in Spain also, there was a, a jealousy in an attempt to seize their property. That's true. Yeah, so there's economic, economic gain, but I mean, there wasn't in, in Germany as well, right? I mean, well, there, there, there was, but um, um, I, I think most people who don't know don't realize that Jews in Germany in 1932 were a little bit less than 1% of the population. Yeah. They didn't really yeah. run things. Uh, yeah. and we, we also know that Himmler was quite astonished in areas they conquered. He expected to find more Jews. Now, of course, in Poland there were, but you know, in Western Europe, there weren't that many. So, uh, uh, but I'm sure you have other people to discuss this bizarre fixation on Jews. And uh, of course, it's alarming that in some ways it's coming back here also, uh, and in Western Europe, both from the left and from the right, but I'll leave that to other lecturers to discuss. So another question uh, from an audience member is how the Japanese government has dealt with this aspect of their history and whether this is taught in schools in Japan. So it's not so much that um, that uh, the schools deny what happened, they just don't teach it. Mm. And there's been this big controversy. So uh, one of the reasons I know about this is because I had a student here who got his PhD who's a professor at Stanford and he's Korean and he's uh, head of a East Asian Institute there and has conducted conferences and I've participated in them and helped edit one of the books. And uh, he points out and others who have participated in these conferences and these books that he's produced have shown that the denial is, is ig pretending ignorance rather than denying what actually happened. It's just not, not really taught. And then the other thing that is done is that the Japanese have presented themselves, uh, not, not all, it's a political issue there too, and it always has been. There are some people on the left, some historians, some teachers, the teachers unions who have uh, uh, wanted to present a more realistic version, but the Japanese tend to present themselves as victims and they point to the atomic bombs and say, look, you know, yes, terrible things happen, but we, we were just as much victims. And, um, so uh, you can sympathize and say that uh, they were victims of bombings, but that doesn't deny what they did. Yeah. And they just don't teach it well enough. And it's a very sensitive topic there and it continues to be one, but it's also one that's exploited by the Chinese government <laughs> uh, and, and for its own advantages. And it's, it's very strongly felt in Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, I mean, uh, you know, we have Korea specialists in the yeah. Jackson School who can tell you about that, but the anti-Japanese feeling is really quite phenomenal in view of the fact that the Japanese and Korean economies are closely tied and that they're allies on the same side and allied with the United States. But the feelings in uh, Korea, uh, the feelings in Korea and in Japan uh, and in China, I'm sorry, are, are much stronger than toward the Germans in Europe because the Germans d did teach and still teach and have apologized. And so today um, you don't find many people in France who still resent what happened in World War II. I mean, that, that's the past, that, that's my parents' generation. It's not even my generation and the younger generation, they don't care, you can go across the border um, and, and it, it's, pretty much disappeared, um, mm -hmm. not so in East Asia. That's really interesting. Okay, so final question. Can you tell us about your next research project? You told me hints about it and I think it's very relevant <laughs> to the subject. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm just starting. Um, but, um, it's about collaborators 
and traders. So, um, and I start with Vichy, France, which I know a lot about because my family was, was there. I was born in Vichy, France. And of course I heard stories. I mean, I, I was a baby, so I don't have any direct memory of what happened. And uh, we, we were uh, protected in a village by uh, uh, very nice people. Um, but the French government collaborated. And uh, as I said in my lecture, um, the conservatives who took power after France was defeated wanted to be allies of Hitler. So why? Uh, were they Nazis? Uh, were they cowards? Were they corrupt? Uh, were they ideologically confused? They were all those things. Uh, and, but there was that kind of collaboration in China and, and, and everywhere. I mean, in every country in Europe. It's pretty much agreed that if there hadn't been collaboration, the Germans never would have been able to kill as many Jews. Because mm -hmm. they were occupying countries where they didn't speak the language, they didn't know of course, they knew in Germany who, who was who. But, and the proportions of Jews who are killed is quite different from one country to another. There was more or less collaboration. It's a very complicated and difficult issue. Uh, so, um, uh, but there, there have been other examples of collaboration. It comes up today. I mean, who's collaborating with evil? <laughs> and uh, I mean, I asked that myself in this country. I mean, who's collaborating with some of the terrible things that's happening? Some do it out of ideological conviction. Some do it uh, just because they're opportunists. Uh, some just stand by and go along with whatever is happening, which is, I think, what most people do. Um, some are just corrupt. Uh, and it's interesting to try to untangle what the motivations are because otherwise it's very difficult to understand a lot of history. Who works, who works with evil, who works with the enemy. Um, some of the key uh, Amer uh, spies who greatly helped the Soviet Union get the first atomic bomb like Klaus Fuchs did it out of ideological conviction. There was nothing corrupt about it. They thought that, that communism was the righteous future of the world. So some collaboration is that. And of course, sometimes, I mean, if you're, a, if you're, if you consider you're the good guys, you know, we have people who have collaborated with us in South Vietnam and who collaborated with us in Afghanistan and in Vietnam, those who collaborated with us are seen as traitors, but do we view them as traitors? And so these are very interesting historical questions. Wow, well, I hope that we'll have more of these lecture series in the future and that you can revisit us when you have more answers. Thank you so much for this wonderful lecture and for this great Q&A. Um, and thank you all of you in the audience for joining us in the series. Students, I wanna remind you that UW has mental health resources available to you. Um, and students enrolled in the class, um, you can go over to Canvas at 5.30 to continue our class discussion. I wanna remind everyone to come back next week on that vote counting day um, for Professor Naomi Sokolov's lecture on Jewish dogs and the Nazi beast, animal studies and Holocaust literature. Professor Sokolov will discuss how Nazis view Jews as subhuman and often refer to them as dogs, apes or vermin. Um, and she will discuss how Jews experienced and responded to this dehumanization. Um, her talk is gonna focus on narratives of hidden children and on ways that animal studies and Holocaust studies can contribute to one another. Professor Sokolov will be joined in this conversation with Denise Grolmus, who's a graduate of UW's English department, an award-winning journalist and a faculty member in the Department of Communication at S S South Seattle Community College. So you know you'll need the distraction next Tuesday. Come join us. We're looking forward to another great conversation. So we're now going to end the webinar. A YouTube link will be sent to you very soon. Thank you so much, everyone.